Hello students, welcome back. I do apologize about my two-week hiatus. I was asked to assist Professor Pendrake with an expedition into lands known to be occupied by some circle of Oberos. Which, who knew the info? Not entirely sure. Most of the time, Pendrake's expeditions to study extraordinary zoology are more or less safe. However, at this particular junction, he required myself and Jack and a few soldiers to tag along just in case the druids had some issues with us getting near their sacred sites. All in all, saw a lot of man-eating plants and some particularly nasty war beasts we will be discussing later this semester. Also lost some teeth, so speaking normally may be a stretch, but we must go on. As discussed in our previous lecture notes, we will be going over every known warlock in the Circle Obros, their trainings, their history, and some of their particular skills, as well as some of my experiences with them, if I have any. At least as many as I can in this class. There have been a lot more known actions as of late, with the Circle almost like they are trying to halt some natural disaster or something. Let's see how many we can clear out today. All right, let's begin. The Warlocks of the Circle Obros are brought to you by the fantastic writers at Privateer Press. Working to forestall the unavoidable apocalypse, druids few in number and face many threats. Should they fail in their work, the devour worm's attention will return to the world to topple mountains, set loose tsunamis, and erase humanity from the face of Cain. The monumental task set before them requires blacklads to be focused and pragmatic, but also to accumulate power. Circle warlocks are deeply political and ambitious. As they engage in far-reaching schemes, these druids seek to elevate themselves not purely out of self-interest, but also because they believe they alone possess the knowledge and mastery to accomplish their order's mission. In the circle of Ulbrus, the term warlock is rarely used. The ability to master a battle group is viewed as a normal extension of a druid's power. Being a warlock is a distinction only related to a specific daily bind and command of war beasts that answer the call of the blacklads, including the mighty natural constructs called wolves. These druids call upon the power of their beasts as much as they do upon the ley lines of Cain, also using their bond with these creatures to avoid injury and even death. For this reason, Circle of Obros are formidable battlefield leaders. Power flowing through blacklads gives them the supernatural health and vitality. Most live about twice as long as ordinary humans, some even longer. This longevity affords them time to gather power and to learn the mysteries of the Order. However, their work is also perilous as they must stand ever ready to fight battles with rival powers. They are few in numbers and death of a black lad is never taken lightly. Still, losses among the young and inexperienced are inevitable. The true purpose of the Circle of Obros are known only to its highest ranking members. It is not uncommon for lower ranking druids to be unaware of the significance of their missions. They often juggle seemingly contradictory directives while trying to rise through the Order's ranks. Internal conflict is expected and even tolerated to a point. Though high-ranking druids do expect to be obeyed and use their power to enforce their will, those strong enough to evade punishment earn the right to choose their own path. Given their limited number, druids rely heavily on others to fight and die in their stead. Those enlisted to do so include the wolf sworn, warriors tied to the blacklads by old oaths and promises, as well as a number of wilderness races convinced to support the druids by promises, extortion, and manipulation. But most vital to the circle's survival are its war beasts, both natural and constructed, which serve the most powerful druids directly. Fully understanding the value of this resource, the Circle of Olboros has created a substantial infrastructure dedicated to building wolves, as well as safeguarding and training wild beasts. Next chapter, the wilding. Each black clad is born with a potential of endless power. This is called the wilding, an innate connection to the devourer worm. This connection taps into the primal power of the natural world and is linked to elemental chaos and predation, as well as the energies below the surface of Cain the magma, and the stone that are the very blood and bones of Orboros. The age in which the wilding manifests varies. It usually comes on to those between three and seven years old, but there are individuals who go through it later, even as adults. Those ignorant of Orboros often mistake the wilding as for madness. It prompts behavior such as wandering forests alone at night, barking, howling, and exhibiting an animalistic behavior and staring deeply into the eyes of animals to sense their emotions. Most communities shun children who display these characteristics. 
Because the wilding is an inborn gift that cannot be taught, a top priority of the circle is to find and protect such individuals as early as possible and provide them with the training necessary to control their abilities. To this end, the circle has become adept at sensing the emergence of this power. The circle has refined its methods such that it can find these children regardless of where they are born. The highest ranking druids can sense the wildling as a thumbing across the ley lines. The druids have also kept a close record on bloodlines known to manifest the wilding, many whom now belong to Wolf Sworn. These families are familiar with the signs of the wilding and willingly surrender their children who display such signs to the druids. Once the children with the potential to undergo the wilding has been identified, one or more experienced black lads are dispatched to recover the candidate for the order. In some cases, druids may be able to persuade parents to voluntarily hand over the child particularly if he is born into a wolf's foreign community already bound to the black lads. In the civilized region, parents are more likely to be intractable, in which case the druids may need to resort to kidnapping. Under no circumstances is refusal accepted, a truth that is added to the sinister reputation of the black lads. So that explains the kidnapping of children, we hear. At least they're not sacrificed in some blood ritual. At least not all of them. Next chapter, Upbringing and Training. A single mentor usually serves as a replacement parent, overseeing the young druid from the time of entry into the fellowship until the child becomes a full wilder. Such children are taken hundreds of miles from their communities to minimize the chance of contacting with their family. It is not uncommon for freshly inducted youths to try to escape and return home, but mentors ensure such efforts never succeed until a youth completes early training and can be trusted to enter battle alongside other members of the circle. His mentor might refer to him as a disparaging term such as cub, pup, worm, or weed. A true name must be earned. Wow, that actually explains a lot of why their names are so weird and nature-like. Huh. Mentoring a young druid is time-consuming and distracting, a task many black lads resent. Though it must be performed this duty in time, mentors are often cruel and unforgiving, subjecting their wards to a gauntlet of trials and severe training. Initiates learn to fear and respect their mentors, seeing them as an all-powerful and all-knowing. The relationship between mentors and their wards leaves a lasting impression on the youths and shapes how they wield their power and view the leaders of the organization. A druid's upbringing is harsh. Only the youngest are even remotely protected from life's hardships, and even they must soon learn how to handle themselves and survive. They are quickly introduced to, to the realities of the wilds and the elemental forces they must master. Young druids are subjected to injury, specifically to learn how to recover. They are steeped in the philosophy and principles of the Circle of Oberos, and all connections to friends and family are severed, even if the family is among the wolf sworn. The druids must stand apart. Black lads are a tight-knit and secretive society who adherents draw a clear distinction between members and outsiders. By the time a new black lad is fully indoctrinated, he is convinced the only other members of the circle are worthy peers. Every black clad must be prepared to sacrifice subordinates and allies for the cause. Perhaps the most important skill an initiate will learn is how to tap into the mystical energies flowing through the ley lines that crisscross cane. The black clads draw upon the energy and channel it into permanent standing stone sites to enable vital rituals. Most arcanists and mystics of Imoran are blind to the ley lines but to the druids they are tangible and real. This process changed the initiate's perspective, allowing him to comprehend his true nature and his connection to Oberos. Once the druids learn to sense the flow of the energies through the landscape and in other members of the order, he perceives a corresponding emptiness in ordinary humans. The distinction between black lads and outsiders become undeniable. The wilding manifests differently in each individual, and a young druid must look inward to master that power. Each aspiring druid is exposed to a powerful beast the circle controls and tested intuitive affinities. Exposure to wolves and raw elemental forces follow. Early in the process, a mentor can discern whether an initiate has the potential to bond with and control war beasts. Druids have greater success in developing those with that potential than any other organization in Western and Morin. Once training is complete, a druid is recognized as a full wilder a rank representing the capability, but no authority. Wilders are sent into battle as risky but effective crucibles. Senior druids do everything in their power to preserve youthful potential, but fatalities are inevitable. 
The same natural forces that ensure only the strongest predators survive also apply to aspiring druids. The weak are cold. Druids who endure and grow in power may be promoted to a warder, first rank where they actually bear responsibility. As a druid rises in the order, he earns honorifics that have considerable significance and may change over time. Warders with ambition and desire to lead may eventually earn the rank of overseer. This station brings greater authority and the oversight of territories granted by the higher ranking superiors. As a druid ascends in rank, he earns larger and more scattered territories and tackles increasingly difficult tasks, sometimes on his own initiative. Above overseers are a small group of the most powerful leaders of the Circle Oberos, the Potents. At the highest rank of leadership are the three Omnipotents, a triumvirate that oversees the entire order and who work together have divided the known world between them. Omnipotents know the order's deepest secrets and full scope of its goals. Next chapter, Tasks and Responsibilities. As a black clad evolves into his role as an agent of the order and a protector of its mysteries, he takes on a number of responsibilities. The infrastructures of the Circle Operos relies on the tireless efforts of its members. Senior black clads divide larger tasks into smaller ones and delegate them to lower ranking druids, including both their own subordinates and any other they can persuade, intimidate, or extort to do their bidding. It is common for mid-ranking blacklads to be kept busy under the weight of the task demanded on them by more powerful individuals they fear to disappoint. As an added complication, druids frequently oversee territories that include large regions with the borders of powerful nations or held by a well-armed rival wilderness group. It is not necessary for the Circle Oberus to fully control a region to consider to be part of the druids' territory. For example, some key leyline conjunctions are inaccessible because they lie within major cities or are occupied by hostile tribes or armies. A druid with such holdings is accepted to keep a watch on these areas, either directly or through its agents, and to look for opportunities to break the hold of the circle's rivals. So if they don't control it, they do control it, and if they don't, they will. Makes perfect sense. Tasks related to preserving the infrastructure of the circle include building and repairing sacred sites, tending and training war beasts, constructing wolds, mentoring a wilder, and creating or maintaining relationships with allied organizations or potential minions. These sorts of missions a black clad may be sent on include gathering intelligence, delivering vital messages or warnings, and fighting the order's enemies. Warlocks handle a majority of combat-related tasks and missions. Such endeavors can include defensive measures, like keeping sacred sites safe from interlopers, or more proactive steps like gathering an armed force to track down and eliminate enemies of the order. Some druids have specialized in leading strike forces, and their fighting talents are so crucial to the order that they have little time for anything else. Warlocks are expected to see their responsibilities personally or through their intermediaries and allies, but can request aid from peers or superiors. The rise of major adversaries such as the Legion of Everblight have forced a greater degree of cooperation and the gathering of larger armies than has been typical in the past. And that concludes all the information we have on our training. I know it's not much, but it's kind of hard, I imagine, for our scribes to learn about a, a faction as secretive as the Druids and who don't talk to people very much. Alrighty, class, that concludes the short form of Warlock training. Thanks to the information provided to us by the fantastic writers and archivers at Privateer Press. As always, your homework is please like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your fellow gamers, and we can get this class a little bit more full. Thank you so much. Class 